First of all, I'd like to thank Aubrey for inviting me, and I'd like to thank you and the audience in advance for not giving Aubrey a hard time for inviting me. <clears throat> <laughs> so, topic is evidence that cryonics may work. Cryonics is the practice of preserving legally dead humans and animals at cryogenic temperatures in the hope that future science can restore them to a healthy living condition as well as rejuvenate them. So note especially, we're only working with legally dead humans, and uh, cryogenic tem temperatures are temperatures below minus 110 degrees Celsius. And also, the point is to uh, not only cure the disease of the, of the person when they're re reanimated, that problem too, and then to rejuvenate them. Rejuvenating is a very important part of the whole program. So the, the aspects I'm going to discuss, focus on here are cooling and storage at low temperature, avoiding ice formation, and the fact that being legally dead does not necessarily mean being irreversibly dead. So most of us know that you can keep food in a refrigerator or freezer, and that'll, that'll preserve them, preserve it. Uh, most, of, most people know that children, uh, especially children, many adults too, have fallen in this water. And, um, um, remained in, in the ice water without uh, with uh, without their heart heart heartbeat or respiration, and recovered without neurological damage. And uh, ex similar experiments have been done on dogs, um, at uh, kept at uh, 10 degrees Celsius, uh, endured uh, over 90 minutes actually of cardiac arrest without neurological damage. Uh, the, nor the northern wood frog does even better. They can spend months uh, in uh, semi-frozen condition, the minus three to minus six, with uh, full recovery of heartbeat uh, upon rewarming. So the principles of, of cooling here is that metabolism is based on biochemical reactions, and ischemic damage is a biochemical reaction, and and. Uh, well, chemical reactions are just chemical reactions, and uh, cooling can slow chemical reactions. And actually, there's the uh, temperature dependence of uh, chemical reaction rates uh, that's determined by the Arrhenius equation. So there is the Arrhenius equation. And here you see this is the reaction rate and uh, expresses a function of the um, um, energy of activation and the uh, temperature. These are constants, the gas constant and uh, a collision constant. And um, so you can take the log of both sides and, and then uh, make two equations. So you've got two reaction rates and two temperatures and then subtract one from the other. So you've got one equation again, do a little arrangement, rearrangement. And now you've got um, a ratio of two reaction rates uh, expressed as a function of, of uh, two temperatures. So um, as an example, I, I take rabbit muscle lactate dehydride dehydrogenase, which has an activation energy of uh, 13,100 calor calories per mole. And I do a little calculation here use, uh, comparing um, I, uh, <clears throat> melting point of water, zero degrees Celsius, with uh, human body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. And we see that uh, at, uh, a human, the, at a human body temperature, the reaction proceeds 18 times faster than it does at zero degrees. And um, as a point of reference, uh, experimentally, it's been shown that uh, oxidative phosphorylation proceeds about uh, 20 times faster at uh, human body temperature than it does at 4 degrees Celsius. So it just shows that the Arrhenius equation uh, calculations in the right ballpark. So carrying this logic a little bit further, I, I, compare, I look at uh, dry ice temperature compared to human body temperature. We see that human body temperature goes uh, 400,000 times faster. Uh, down to minus 120 degrees Celsius, uh, it goes 3 billion times faster, and liquid nitrogen temperature, uh, 9 octillion times faster. That's uh, 9 times 10 to the 27th. So you see that um, liquid nitrogen temperature, you're basically not getting much, uh, hardly any reaction rate at all. Uh, of course, this is all based on uh, uh, the assumption that you're in a liquid phase, and you aren't. And so things are reacting less because uh, uh, at, the, at minus 130 degrees Celsius, viscosity is greater than 10 to the 13th poise because uh, you're in a solid state. And uh, get down to liquid nitrogen temperature and mammalian temp uh, tissue is even stable against background radiation for many centuries. 
So that's the temperature problem. What about ice formation? Well, most, many people think that when you freeze mammalian tissues that, that the ice freezes inside of the cells and, and the cells burst, but actually what happens is the water osmotically leaves the cells to, to freeze in pure form, and as, as the water expands, it, it uh, crushes the dehydrated cells and the increasingly diminishing uh, uh, unfrozen channels. But uh, in cryonics, uh, we try to use cryoprotectants to uh, antifreeze compounds to uh, reduce the ice formation. And uh, these work by hydrogen bonding colligative action. Uh, they get between the water molecules. So you can see these, uh, these are the most common cryoprotectants probably. Uh, and see they have uh, these uh, groups here that are very, uh, very facile at hydrogen bonding. And they're small molecules that can get in the way and have a good colligative effect. So ethylene glycol, that's the antifreeze that you use in automobiles. Propylene glycol has been used in ice cream to reduce uh, ice crystals, not used so much anymore. Uh, glycerol has been used since, uh, uh, since the 1950s to cryopreserve uh, sperm and uh, blood. And uh, DMSO is the most uh, co commonly used uh, cryoprotect used in cryobiology. So. Um, we're trying to avoid crystallization and achieve vitrification, which is uh, vitrification is a, a solidification without crystallization. It's another solid state. Uh, it's a glassy state. Um, a crystal is an organized uh, molecular solid state, and a glass is uh, disorganized. Um, we can use mixtures of, of cryoprotectants to vitrify animal tissue. Uh, we replace the order, and we completely eliminate uh, water crystallization with good vitrification. Uh, uh, mixtures. And, and they're less toxic than using pure cryoprotectants, and uh, they're synergistic, so you can use lower concentrations. And um, you can also include ice blockers or antifreeze programs, uh, antifreeze proteins to, um, um, in these mixtures. So uh, a familiar uh, gla uh, glass is amber, and you can slowly uh, cool sucrose to um, and form uh, rock candy or um, uh, ice, uh, sugar crystals, and um, uh, or you can add uh, um, corn syrup and um, make a lollipop, which would be a vit vitreous glass. Uh, you can slowly cool silicon dioxide and uh, get quartz or sand, or you can add uh, sodium o sodium oxide and. Uh, calcium oxide, and you get soda lime glass, which is the common glass that's used in uh, you know, vessels for drinking beverages and uh, window panes and that sort of thing. So if you've ever watched a glass blower uh, at work, uh, you'd see this uh, very uh, syrupy uh, glass being cooled down, and it will uh, get more and more viscous until it achieves a solid state. And there's no phase transition, no, no distinct phase transition uh, of the kind you get when, uh, when you're changing to a, a solid state in a crystal um, from liquid to a solid state. The most popular organ for um, <clears throat> vitrification currently is the ovary. And the greatest success has been with the mouse ovary. And uh, that's been uh, vitrified and stored in liquid nitrogen, at liquid nitrogen temperature and rewarmed and uh, used for um, um, producing live uh, pup birth rates uh, uh, comparable to that from a uh, fresh ovary. Now, um, vitrification mixtures that we use in cryonics uh, solidify just below minus 120 degrees Celsius. So um, hippocampal slide has been vitrified to a solid state at minus 130 degrees Celsius and then rewarmed uh, to give nearly uh, normal ultrastructure under electron microscope and also viability uh, in excess of 90% of normal. Uh, the way we measure viability is by intracellular potassium-sodium ratios. So we assume that the sodium pump is functioning well uh, uh, in order to give you a good ratios. And also, the membrane obviously must be in, intact. Um, <clears throat> I, the greatest success of vitrification to date, uh, to my knowledge, is uh, vitrification of the rabbit kidney. And uh, rabbit kidney has been uh, vitrified to minus 135 degrees cel uh, Celsius and uh, transplanted into a rabbit uh, and operating.